Welcome to the Bethel Church Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message by Pastor Chris Vallotton. For more information about this podcast and other resources, visit Bethel.com. Um, can you guys grab hands and pray at the same time? You can get a girlfriend too, this, this way. <laughs> Pretty famous for that. So uh, if you're watching online, just pray with us now. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing all over the world. All over the world, you're moving powerfully. And I thank you, Lord, that it's not a Bethel thing. It's a kingdom thing all over the world. And Lord, we bless what you're doing today here in this congregation this morning, all that listen to this message. In Jesus' name, amen. And, and bless the speaker in Jesus' name. Bless the speaker. <clears throat> I, I want to talk to you about love that actually wins. And it feels like there's a lot of confusion about what is the love of God and what, you know, how do you display the love of God and what isn't the love of God. And I love what Heidi Baker said. In fact, my favorite message of Heidi Baker's is, love looks like something. So the question is, what does love look like? And I'm very concerned about uh, something I see happening in the body of Christ. And uh, it, it seems like it's always there, but it seems like it's really growing. And, and it's, it's, it's the gospel according to me. It's kind of like the gospel. People read the Bible and they begin to teach like they go to a restaurant and choose scriptures on a menu. Like, I'll take some pie, I'll take some ice cream. And I, I don't want any steak. I'm, I'm a Gracetarian. <laughs> and we sort of choose a menu of what we want to believe. And we create another religion in the name of Jesus. And we make the Bible say something it doesn't actually say. And so I want to talk today about love that actually does win. I'd like to just start in John, 1 John chapter 4, if you could go there with me. And uh, I, um, I love the book of 1 John. I think John, Peter and John are my two favorite uh, apostles. I, I, I love Peter because he reminds me of me, and I love John because he reminds me of Bill. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I love the way they got sent out together, because that's how it happened with us, and I love that they seldom agree. But anyway, uh, Bill and I agree all the time, just being funny. Um, so I want to just take us to 1 John chapter 4, and I want to start with verse 1. Beloved, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, if I made that statement to you, probably the first question that it, it comes to your mind is, well, wow, how do I know if I'm being influenced by the wrong spirit so I don't become a false prophet? And how do I know false prophets who are being influenced by the wrong spirit? And we're really not going to do a study on this chapter today because our, our subject is really love. But um, this chapter is actually about false prophets and how to discern a true and a false prophet. How many of you remember that song? Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone that loves... He that loveth not, for God is love. Beloved, let us love one another first. First John. I bet you never knew that that song was about false prophets. That song's about false prophets. He that loveth not, the context is, don't be a false prophet by not loving. And so I want to talk a little bit about this chapter. Let's go to verse 7 where we actually just sang the verse. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this the love of God was manifest in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us, and he sent his son to be a perpetuation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Now, in the context of the whole, how do I know the spirit of God and the spirit of, of Antichrist? How do I know the person who's being influenced by God and the person who's being influenced by Antichrist, how do I know that? John makes a powerful statement that I think is often repeated and seldom understood. And that is that God is love. He doesn't just love. He doesn't have the attribute of love. He is love. And the, point, and the reason why that's important is 
John is saying that everyone who's born again is born into God who is love. Therefore, the first test of the false prophet is they can't possibly not display the love of God because God doesn't just love as an attribute. God loves as the nature of who he is as God. Are you with me? So you can't say you know God and not love. Because if you know God, you inherently love because you were made in his image and in his likeness. And God is love. Therefore, if you're born again, you were born into love. Not to love, into love. In other words, when you love, it's an expression of your nature of who you are in God. It isn't just something you do. It's part of your personification in God. So therefore, you cannot not love and know God. If you don't love your brother, John says, I question whether you were born again because everyone who's born again naturally loves because they were born into a God who is love, doesn't just love. Because so it becomes the proof text of who you are in God that you love people who don't love you. Did you get that? Jesus said, if you love people who love you, what do you do any different than the people who don't know God? Don't sinners love sinners? The point is, is that when you love me and I love you back, I am just reciprocating the love that you gave me. But when I love you and you didn't love me, when you abuse me and I still love you, I am pointing to the fact that I am in God and I have a resource and that resource is not you. I am demonstrating, I am giving evidence that I am in God because you treated me bad and I treated you well. I did not treat you out of reciprocation. I treated you out of source. Are you with me? How many know there's a big difference between God is love and love is God? Some people make love a God. When I make love a God, then I'm always working for love instead of from love. How many, oh, let me say it this way. There's a big difference between my girl is a dog and my dog is a girl. Any explanation needed on that? God is love, but love is not God. People spend their lives chasing love when they should be rooted in God and they would have love because it would be their nature. Good point, Chris. Verse 16. We have come to know and believe the love which God has loved us, God, God has, which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Verse 17, by this love is perfected in us, that we have confidence in the day of judgment. For as he is, so are we in this world. Uh-oh, what just happened? He just said, there's going to be a day of judgment. In the chapter on love, he just said, and there'll be a day of judgment, and you'll be confident. I thought love took care of judgment. And he just said, I love you so much, there'll be a day of judgment, and you won't be afraid. Now, there's this whole idea in the new Christianity that there is no hell, That everyone is saved, universalism, like Jesus died for the world, the cosmos, the word there in Greek is the word cosmos, it doesn't mean person, it means he died for the whole world, Jesus died for the whole world, and therefore everyone's going to be saved, and listen, there are people who know they're saved, and people who don't know they're saved, but everybody's saved. And by the way, the word Gehenna is, uh, was, is, is, that we translated hell is a dump outside of Jerusalem, and we're not going to the dump, it's just figurative. And therefore, there really is no hell. And I'm like, what a cruel thing for God to require Jesus to save us from nothing. So let me read you the gospel. The ones you don't order on the menu. And I want to tell you that this is so, like, I would not want to be in a church that preached this every week. I would not go to a church that preached this every week. I live in a church that preached this every week. Many years ago, prior to, it was B.C., before Bill. (laughs) Or I guess that would be B.B., wouldn't it? (laughs) 
Listen, right now you're not listening because I can spell. Let's go to what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 13, verse 40. So just as the tares are gathered up, we're talking, Jesus has just finished telling the story of the wheat and the tares and how they grow up together and how at the end of the harvest, they separate the wheat from the tares. And so he's just finished telling that story. We're picking up at the last part of his conversation in verse 40. And Jesus says, just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so it shall be at the end of the age. The son of man will send forth his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all the stumbling blocks and those who have committed lawlessness and, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of feet. Now, you'll notice Jesus doesn't use the word hell, but he uses weeping and gnashing of teeth. He uses fire and furnace. And by the way, Jesus makes that statement, that exact phrase, eight times in three Gospels. Jesus. Remember Jesus? Okay, well, let me give you another one, because you got that look. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Or do you think highly, I'm sorry, do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads to repentance? Uh, This is one of our main scriptures. The kindness of God leads to repentance. How many believe that? Now let's read the next scripture. The very next verse on the menu. But because of your stubbornness, an unrepentant heart, You are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and the revelation of righteous judgment of God, You who will render to each person according to his deeds, to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, eternal life, but to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation. Did, Did you get that? This is in the book of Romans. You know this book of Romans that says... Nothing can separate you from the love of God. It's the same book that says that, that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you know there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? But there's a ton of condemnation, sanctioned com- condemnation by God for those who aren't. Okay, I'm going to keep reading and you can just keep giving me that look. <laughs> Did we come to Bethel? When, when's Bill going to be back? <laughs> Revelation 6.15. I've heard Bill preach this before too. Revelation 6.15. This is Revelation. It's in the New Testament. Are you with me? The kings of the earth and the great men and commanders and the rich and the strong and the slave and the free men hid themselves in caves and among the mountains, in the, among the rocks in the mountains. And they said to the mountains... And to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne, from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of wrath has come, and who is able to stand before it? Did you notice that the wrath was coming from the Lamb, not the lion? Here we go. See, the terror of hell is the depth of love. It's so horrible that no one would ever want to go there. If you don't love God, at least you will hate hell. Either way, you won't do evil to your brothers whom God loves. God doesn't send people to hell. God said, over my dead body will you go to hell. But how many know a lot of people step over his dead body? Verse uh, 18 of John. Let's go back to 1 John. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he's a liar. For no one, for the one who does not love his brother, who he's seen, cannot love God, who he's not seen. This is the commandment I've given you, that the one who loves God should love his brother. God isn't saying there is no punishment. The previous verse says, there is a day of judgment. He's just saying, if you love, you won't fear punishment Because punishment is for people who are evil. (laughs) And therefore, you'll have confidence in the day of judgment, knowing that you loved because you stayed in love. And therefore, you know that if you are right with God, because when you think about punishment, you're not afraid. You go, that won't be for me. Because it's called a great and terrible, and you're on the great side, not the terrible side. Listen, 
this thing about love. If I see a 12 year old boy, and I'm walking down the streets of New York, and someone, some man is beating this boy with a bat, does love require me to do anything? Pray? I pray. Can I give you a few verses on that? I like the one about turning the other cheek. No, no. Love requires me to do something, right? Let me try over here. Love requires me to do something. I must intervene. Love requires me to intervene. I, I, I am required to try to stop this boy from being punished. Why? Because I love, I will do violence to this man if necessary to keep him from punishing this boy. Love, the, <laughs> I want peace, but it's the prince of peace that crushes Satan on your feet. How many know peace often comes at violence? Love requires me to do something. <laughs> Do, I, do we build prisons because we love people or because we hate them? I would propose it's because we love people. Okay, let me give you an example. We, we lived next to a crazy neighbor some years ago, before we lived in the house we're in now. They were crazy. Like, I built a, a, a basketball court, a small basketball court. It's a very small yard. Just a, poured a little concrete and put up a basketball hoop. And the very first day, I'm out there ba- bouncing the ball, and the lady, my next door neighbor, comes over. She's uh, from over the fence, and she, she's old. She's probably 50. <laughs> I want to tell you, old has really changed with me. <laughs> she is an older lady, actually. And she starts yelling at me. And she's like, you're bouncing the ball. It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I go, uh-huh. I-, I never said you could build a basketball court in your backyard. And I very kindly said, I didn't remember asking you. <laughs> I was kind of being sarcastic and thought we'd make it light. And she's like, I want you to tear down that basket. That's making noise. I, 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 live, I live next door to you. You cannot dribble a ball. I said, well, I'm not dribbling a ball at night. It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I can't watch TV while you dribble a ball. I'm, I'm really sorry. So sorry. I, I was very kind to her. I'm like, I'm so very sorry. I will do my best to not dribble at night. And Anyway, it got worse and worse and worse, and pretty soon she has a 30-year-old son, 31 or 2-year-old son, who's now throwing things at me over the fence, and then he ends up coming over the fence after me, and then we're in the front yard in an altercation, and we're calling the police, and deploying the police, and they're calling the police. Listen, I don't want the police to bring a Bible. <laughs> I already did that. It didn't work. I want them to bring a gun. I want the man, if he doesn't do right because he loves, I want him to do right because he fears. And this man has been in prison before, according to the police. And I'm like, and Kathy's like, I don't want to be home alone. Listen, if I get off at at four and you get off at five, I'll wait till you get home. Like, it got that bad. Like, I don't want to go home. I'm afraid. And I'm like, I want this man to be afraid of the law. (laughs) Okay, I'm going to read you a verse that I'm right. I'm going to show you. Romans 13, verse 1. Every person is to be in subjection to governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. Okay, five chapters earlier. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm going to show you that Paul says that government officials are there to bring condemnation. You go, there's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Love is not from God. Love is, I'm sorry, fear is not from God. Did I say love is? That little, that little, that little laugh, it was rude. I didn't feel loved at all when you... Fear is not from God. I'd propose that fear, love is from God because God is love, but fear is also from God. I'm going to read it to you. Let me let, me let Paul tell you. <laughs> Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and those who oppose, oppose the ordinances shall receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers is not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. If it is a minister of God for you, for good. 
But if you do evil, be afraid. This is in the Bible. The same guy who five chapters earlier wrote, no fear. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. I'm going to tell you what can separate you from the love of God. The fear of God. (laughs) The fear of God comes in your life when you won't be controlled from the inside out. God goes, I'll control you from the outside in. If I have a a three-year-old and we live on a freeway and it's dangerous, I want him to understand that if he runs out in the freeway, he's going to die. He gets hit by a car. And I want him to obey out of honor and love. But if he doesn't, this works pretty good. (laughs) I'm not threatening him because I don't love him. I'm threatening him because I do love him. The more concerned I am that he may not obey out of wisdom, love, and honor, the greater the threat becomes. (laughs) You go into that freeway and I catch you, I will, listen, listen, look at your mother. Look at your mother. You see her eyes? Yes. I will put you in the room and feed you through a knot hole until you're 15. You understand that? You understand that? Look in my eyes. You're scaring your mother. I'm saying, I raise the punishment, not so you'll do it, so you won't. Okay, I'm not done. I'm not done. But if you do evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. It is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who who practices evil. (laughs) Did you get that? Okay, let me go down to verse 7 because this is so intense. Render to all what is due to them. Tax to whom tax is due. Custom whom custom is due. Fear to whom fear is due. And honor to whom honors do. Do you understand that God could take away all sin right now in the whole world? All he has to do is make you like him instinctively. But he can't make you love him instinctively. Because love requires choice. Love requires choice. So how many understand God put two trees in the garden? (laughs) I mean, I know the devil, he, take, he gets the rap for like convincing Adam and Eve to eat the wrong tree, but I, I, I'm like, God, why'd you plant one? <laughs> why not plant one tree? Are you with me? God planted two trees because he believes in free will. And the only way you could have, the only way you have the ability to get rewarded for doing the right thing is to have the opportunity to do the wrong one. Why did, why did God put the God of this world on this planet? Why not put him on Mars? Because God wanted you, love requires you to have a choice, which God you will serve. Therefore, there needed to be another one. Love requires choice. But God says, I'm going to give you a choice. You have free will. And by the way, sometimes in government officials, we want government officials to take away all people's choices so they have to do righteousness by the law. And I'd propose that the government, it's not the government's job to keep you from sinning. It's the government's job to keep you from sinning against your neighbor. But what you two consenting adults do in the bedroom by themselves is not the government's business. I didn't say it wasn't the church's business. I didn't say it wasn't someone else's business. I said it's not the church's, it's not the government's business. God gives you permission to sin, and the government can't take it away from you. Government can take away the right for you to sin against your neighbor. And that's what Romans is talking about. And God says, if you don't want to do the right thing for your neighbor out of love, you will do it out of fear. I will condemn you. I will send wrath upon you. I equip these people with a sword to use it against you if you want to hurt your neighbor. What's God doing? He's protecting the 12-year-old. God says, I gave them free will. God, why aren't you doing something? You gave them free will. Why aren't you doing something about these people? molest people and they, they murder people and they rape people. God says, that's what I gave you the right to do. I put it in your hands to take my wrath and use it against them when they do evil. The love of God requires the wrath of God. Jesus didn't save you from Disneyland. (laughs) 
Jesus didn't save you from Disneyland. And he didn't deliver us from a weakling with a water pistol. This Lucifer led a third of the angels who were with God around the throne. He convinced a third of the angels, which who knows how many that is. It has to be in the thousands though. He convinced thousands of angels to disobey God and follow him. This is not a wimpy Pee Wee Herman. Our enemy is a devil that is powerful, infamous, most famous demon who ever was born. And he led a revolt against God when they knew God was God. (laughs) Some people are like, if you knew God, you would serve him. A third of the angels knew God and didn't serve him. Sin did not begin on earth. Knowing God doesn't mean you will serve him. I know lots of people who had deep experiences with God. Three people that I personally mentored who don't walk with God right now, who, who in the renewal were on the floor experiencing God and couldn't get up, had to carry their children to their bedroom because they were under an experience that lasted eight hours and they don't walk with God today. Knowing God doesn't mean you'll serve him. It's not what I want that changes me. It's what I will. Anybody seen that Christian movie, Skyscraper? (laughs) Sorry, it's not a Christian movie. Listen, there's some Egyptian in it. So if you go, like, Chris recommended this movie. No, I just said, it's a movie. And and I watched it on a plane, and they they sort of scrub out some of the Egyptians. So... It may be really bad, but I know it's a little bit bad. It's this, it's this, the movie opens with this building. They're building this building in somewhere in Asia. And this uh, Asian guy builds the, most, the tallest building in the world. It's the most beautiful building in the world. And he's looking for someone to lead his security team. They haven't yet opened the building. And, they, and anyway, Dwayne Johnson, you know who he is? He's like, he's, you know, he's... He, he's, he applies for the job. And this guy's got like, he was a Green Beret. He's like, you know, killed a million people. He's like, he's got, you know, he's only got one leg. The other one's a fake leg, you know. And he's just bad. And he just, and he just, he just applies for the job. And, and the, the, the Asian guy, the, the rich man who built the building said, you can bring your family while you're interviewing and they can stay in the hotel, in the, in the tower. And, you know, it's like, just, they can hang out while you're interviewing. And so they come and, and he says, well, they can stay for a few days. And so they're staying and he's interviewing. He gets the job and he goes, he goes out of the tower to do something and leaves his family there and says, hey, I'll, and I'll be back later today. And, and while he's gone out of the tower, the tower suddenly, half the tower, a, a big piece of the one floor of the tower catches on fire. And it turns out that there's this criminal that wants to tear down the building and he's evil. And, and. And, you know, Dwayne looks up at the tower and his family's stuck in the tower and he, he rushes to the tower to save them and, and his family has a cell phone and they call him and they're like, the tower's on fire, please rescue us. And, and so he's, he's trying to get in the tower and he gets there and they, they've shut the elevators down. And he wants to take the staircase and the staircase is all locked and he's like, oh, what am I going to do? I got to rescue my family. Well, in the meantime, the bad guys tell the police that Dwayne set the fire. So the whole Asian police force, wherever it is in Asia, they're all after him and they're trying to catch him and there's this thousand officers chasing him through the streets and he looks up at the tower and he's like, my family's up there and so he doesn't know what to do so he he climbs this crane which is about from here to the street, this (laughs) thousand foot high crane, you know, you got it, you got it, are you picturing it? Am I doing a good job? And so he climbs the crane and, and the police are shooting at him, boom, 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 and he jumps off the crane. Remember, he's only got one leg. He jumps off the crane, grabs onto the tower. He's dragging down the tower and finally gets, you know, he's like hanging on with one hand, but he, you know, he can do like pull-ups with one arm and he pulls himself up and crashes through the window and, and then, and then he, and then he gets a call and his, it's the guy like, ha, hey, we have your family. We're going to kill them all. Now he's like, wow. And the police chief who's shooting at him and has a whole police force, they see him jump off this crane onto the tower with one leg. 
And the police chief turns to his assistant and says, this man couldn't have set the fire. His family's in there, and look what he'll do to rescue his family. He cannot be the bad guy. And I watch this guy rescuing. It's such a good movie, by the way. <laughs> no, the more I think of it, there's a lot of Egyptian in it. So, I, 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 and he's rescuing this family from them, and it just keeps getting worse. And now the the, you know, the, the thing is collapsing. His family, oh, oh we're help us! And he's. And I'm like, this is like Jesus. <laughs> Jesus did not rescue us from Disneyland. The depth of the tower fire actually just showed the, the, the depth of the love that he had for his family. And I'm like, taking away hell takes away the love of God. What he did. The display of what Jesus did. He didn't call us out of, the, out of the fire. He went down into hell for three days and rescued us. And he took captive a host of captives and he led them to heaven. Are you with me? And when you take away hell, you say, Jesus didn't rescue us for anything. He just died on the cross. For what did he die for? He died to rescue us from a burning inferno and a bad guy. He was the worst bad guy who ever lived. The depths of hell determine the heights of love. Take away hell. You take away the greatest expression of love that ever happened in the history of the cosmos. I want to say this. Jesus is not a Buddhist. People have, they, they have, they have superimposed Buddhism over Christianity. Like Jesus healed the sick, fed the hungry, cast out demons. You know, you know, the whole thing, you know, rebuked the storms, walked on water, you know, raised dead people. But he also rebuked Pharisees. You know, like whitewashed tombs of dead man's bones <laughs> past the potatoes. <laughs> and you're like, oh, oh, he only rebuked religious people. No, he rebuked anyone who needed it. The business people were selling things in the temple and he turned over their tables and chased them out. And it's like, oh, you know, Jesus was so kind. He went home and made a whip. <laughs> Jesus went home and made a whip. And it says that he chased them out. And when the disciples were like, what happened to the love of God? <laughs> he said this, zeal for my house is consuming. The word zeal is the word zo. It means to boil over with fury. They're like, what happened to the love? He goes, I boiled over with fury. <laughs> you can't just have compassion. You have to have the full nature of God. I'm telling you, we become gracetarians. I'll just take milk, ice cream, and a cream pie. Don't give me anything I have to really digest. Think about this. Think about You have to think about that for a minute. The people who are laughing, those are the ones who actually know the Bible about milk and not me. All the rest of you are like, I have no idea why you just, everything, just dairy products. He's just against dairy products. Let's pretend for a moment that you went back, that you could go back in time to the year, let's just say 1815. Eh, 205 years back. And you're telling your friends about what you know. And you say, you know what? You can, they can take the whole Bible and put it on, they can write it on a fingernail. They can write it on something as small as a fingernail. And like, there's no way you can do that. Well, I know, I know Mary, she can write small, but couldn't even get two verses on your fingernail. It's like, no, no, I'm telling you, you can get 43 versions of the Bible on something as small as your fingernail. That's impossible, brother. Our brother has fallen off the rational train. <laughs> what I'm getting at is this. How many understand that it's true that you can write an entire 43 versions of the Bible on something as small as your fingernail. It's called the microchip. 
How many understand that the, a person 200 years ago is processing information through the experience they currently have? which is 200 years short of invention and innovation, what makes it possible to read the entire gospel on something as small as your fingernail. What happens when I read the Bible through my facts and my experience instead of through my faith? I say, that can't be true because I have never experienced it. I have never done it. I'm like, yeah, your teeny weeny little polka dot bikini brain. I mean, God's got two billion years of invention and innovation. And you're like trying to tell God, there's no way you can love people and have hell. I mean, how could you do that? I mean, I, I love people and I would never send them there. Therefore, there's no way you could do that. And I understand more than God. Like you are stupid. <laughs> That's why it's called the faith and not the fact. It isn't that it isn't true. It isn't that these aren't facts. But if God told you the real way it happens, you would not understand it because you haven't had two billion years of invention and innovation. And God says, I love everyone enough to give my life for the entire world. I understand what love is and you don't. So don't tell me what I can and can't do. Well, how about my neighbor? My neighbor has never done anything wrong. He's a nice person, but he never received Jesus. And he's going to burn in hell forever. I don't know about that, but I know that God does. Well, if I don't understand, I can't serve him. Well, Houston, you don't understand how your car works. I'm a mechanic, so I know you don't. You come into my shop and it goes click, click, clock, clock. I don't know what you're talking about, but you drive it every day. You, under, you, you, you like air conditioning. How many of you could even fix the air conditioning unit? Most of you don't even know how to lower the thermostat, but you experience it every day. And you're all fine with it. But then we come to the Bible and like the Bible says something like, oh, I, 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 if I don't understand it, I can't follow. Well, I, oh, well, we're, you're going to live in a little tent by yourself someplace and go potty in a hole. I mean, this is what you understand. And we have people who, quote, are the brightest minds in Christianity teaching garbage in the name of, well, the Greeks said, and I don't think that God would. You don't know. Just, just take it by faith. And God says, listen, I didn't tell you to understand me. I told you to follow me. I told you to follow me. I mean, there are people who get married like, I can't get married until I understand everything about marriage. <laughs> Trust me, I've been married 43 years. I'm still trying to figure out how to relate to one person. I wrote this thing. I want to read it to you. Okay, shut up for a minute so I can read it. It's going to take a few minutes. The need for churches to reconcile people to ourselves instead of to God has undermined the congregation's journey to wholeness and reduced us to spineless sinners, powerless people who remain shackled by their addictions and imprisoned by their ever-changing passions. For many leaders, the ability to share a message without offending anyone or, convince or convicting the congregation is viewed as an art that must be mastered. But there is no such thing as love without conviction. Love is loyal, therefore disloyalty brings conviction. Love is pure, so impurity brings conviction. Love always tells the truth, therefore lying brings conviction. Love always hopes, so hopelessness breeds conviction. I must love you more than my convictions, but I can't love you instead of my convictions. As many people point out, Jesus forgave the woman caught in adultery. Yes, it's true. But he also loved her enough to exhort her, go your way and sin no more. Jesus said to her, did anyone condemn you? She said, no, Lord. He said, I don't condemn you either. Go your way and don't ever sin again. How many you know telling people to never sin again isn't condemnation, it's wisdom. <laughs> Being a virtuous cesspool so that dirty people, all of us are dirty at times, don't feel bad about being dirty reminds, uh, undermines the divine call to help filthy people get clean. It's not that Christians are better than anyone else. It's just that we have acknowledged our sin and our need for a savior. In other words, if we know we have a problem and we've, and we've, uh, we know we have a problem and we've allowed God to provide the solution, but there is no solution until we acknowledge our problem. 
It's impossible to help someone with a problem they don't believe they have. Certain sins might be common or even politically correct, but they're never normal. Furthermore, making sin acceptable undermines any chance for real solutions. Leaving people hopelessly stuck in their sin isn't loving. It's ridiculous, cruel, reckless, and irresponsible. Jesus died to save sinners from sin, not to sin. It's going to get worse. Hang on. <laughs> Compassion is so important in our lives. But it must be, and it must be the central theme of everything we do. But compassion alone is not enough to make a difference. When Jesus drove the money changers out of the temple, turning over their tables and chasing them with a whip, he wasn't overcome with compassion. He was, feel, he was filled with zeal. The, the Greek word zeal in this passage is zo. It means to boil over and be hot or fervent. At the risk of sounding like I'm promoting rage or violence, I must point out that Jesus was overcome with Zo, that he was done being passive with money changers. His blood was boiling, and they were about to get a piece of his mind. Can you imagine the disciples telling Jesus, Jesus, you just need to chillax. Just calm down, or people are going to misunderstand you. No way, Jesus loves people, but compassion must be accompanied with zeal to, be, to see real change. Let me be clear, I'm not advocating violence or force. I'm simply saying that we must, be, we must brave the political spirit and take a stand for righteousness and speak up for morality and refuse to be passive. No one enjoys being misunderstood, but anyone who does anything, will, uh, anything great will be. It just goes with the territory. Jesus' ministry was steeped in misunderstanding, and frankly, he often seemed to rather enjoy it. Like the time he gave his, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood message. That day he preached the multitude, his multitude of followers all the way down to 12. And the disciples only stayed because they had nowhere else to go. Does it trouble you that Jesus didn't try to explain to the crowd? Didn't try to explain himself to the crowd. It does me. I mean, a few minutes of diplomacy might have gone a long way in the situation, but he simply refuses to explain himself, choosing instead to let the crowds disperse in confusion rather than follow by persuasion. Why, you ask? I'm not sure, but it's apparent that, God's tests, that God tests our hearts with mysteries, mistakes, and misunderstandings. Can you imagine the posts if they had social media in Jesus' day? I love the way that Winston Churchill put it. You will never reach your destination if you stop and throw rocks at every barking dog. Unlike Jesus, many leaders in the 21st century are obsessed with wooing the masses with sophistication and wowing them with articulation and keeping them with clever motivation. At what point does our Christian compliance become destructive in society, our silence a doormat, our sympathy a license for the who, those who perpetuate evil against our children? Morality is now being fought in the cribs of our babies, the, the wombs of our mothers, and in the classrooms of our youngest children. I'm not sure sympathy is working. I will not stand by in silence and watch my grandchildren bulldozed into the cesspool of immorality, castrated in the name of intolerance, or mutilated for the sake of diversity. I love, I love everyone, no matter their convictions, but I won't be a doormat to those who want to shove sin down the throat of our children. I will fight for the rights of everyone to have the freedom to make their own choices as they see fit. For instance, what consenting adults do in the privacy of their own bedrooms is not the business of government. However, I will not allow my children to be, I will not allow people to intimidate me into normalizing perversion in the life of our children. Amen. Love is not passive. We are commanded to speak the truth in love. Peace that happens at the expense of morality is not worth having. Solving conflict by selling our souls, or more, more accurately, the souls of our children, is a price not worth paying. Freedom always comes with a price. And the day we stop paying the bill is the day we have begun the short journey back to the consecration camp of, of slavery. I want to say, I want to end with this final thought. Allowing people to sin is different than normalizing sin. People should have the right to sin, providing they're not sinning against their neighbor. And I think I did a good job explaining that. But I can't normalize sin. Because as soon as I normalize sin, I take away the ability to change. Remember, people say all the time, well, those people deserve mercy. <sighs> Who doesn't deserve mercy in this room? Who doesn't need mercy in this room? I, me, foremost. I do not have a past to brag about. 
But how many understand the only way I get mercy is to acknowledge I did something wrong? Because mercy means, the definition of mercy is, I did not get what I deserved. Meaning, I deserve something. Grace means, I got what I didn't deserve. I love this illustration someone shared many years ago. They said, if you're speeding, you're going 50 miles over the speed limit, and a police officer pulls you over, and he doesn't give you a ticket, you just received mercy. You didn't get what you deserved. But if that same police officer pulls you over, you're going 50 miles over the speed limit, and he doesn't give you a ticket, but he gives you $1,000 for speeding, you just received grace. You got what you didn't deserve. Are you with me? The only way I get out of sin, see, sin is my master, and it overpowers my human spirit, but God overpowers sin. The only way I get out of sin is to acknowledge I sinned. Follow me. As soon as I normalize sin, as soon as I say, no, I didn't sin, that's normal, my behavior is normal, do you understand that I, that is not, that is not mercy? Do you understand that I did not give grace to that person? I actually now took away their ability to get out of the place they're in? As soon as I said, as soon as I say, adultery is normal, how many of you know, if it's normal, I don't need mercy? And I'm not going to get grace. Why? I just normalize it. Mercy means I did something wrong. If I say I didn't do anything wrong, how many know I don't get mercy? And I certainly aren't going to get grace. How am I going to get out of the situation? As soon as I normalize sin, I've taken away the ability for people to come out of it. That is not called compassion. That's called stupidity. Listen, if you want to be a homosexual and live a homosexual lifestyle, earnestly, that's your business. I wouldn't want to be in a Muslim country that makes it illegal. But if you want to teach in this school that homosexuality is normal, I'm sorry, I can't normalize it. As soon as I normalize it, I take away your ability, my children's ability, and everyone else's ability to find grace in a time of need. If I don't need, I don't find grace. I'm not mad at anybody, but I refuse to create a culture in which people can't come out of being stuck because I was stuck and I needed to get out of being stuck. If someone would have normalized my sins, I would have never reached out to Jesus. I would have, well, I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm not a sinner. Some of you guys need Jesus, but I'm not. I, 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 my, what I'm doing is normal. Listen, it may be common. Cancer is common, but it ain't normal. It's not because I'm mad at anybody. It's because I do love people. So people are like, oh, you're making people feel bad. I'm sorry, if you're in sin, you should feel bad. I can't tell you how many times I've been up here and Bill's preaching. I love being with Bill. The guy is so noble. And I, I, I'm being honest. And I, probably one in five times, he's, she's teaching up here, and I am convicted. I'm like, did he just read my mail? And it's usually not something I did. It's a thought I had, or the way I think. And I'm like, ha! Oh. Took my heart and just preached it. Go ahead. I should have a part of that intellectual property if you write a book about it. I mean, you obviously looked into my heart and just preached about my problems. I'm so thankful to be in a place where I still feel bad when I do bad. I don't want to feel good about doing bad. And I leave there, and I'm so thankful that God corrects our attitudes before they come actions. And this is how Bill is, and I, and I love being with him for this very, for one of, the, one of the reasons. I'm sitting there listening, I'm like, I know what's going to happen, I know where he's going, and I do this all the time. That's me, self-promotion Chris, right there, self-promotion Chris. <laughs> and I leave there, and I'm like, Holy Spirit, I need help for that. I can see it. I don't like, you preach a message against me, I'm never coming back. I'm like so thankful I'm connected. Remember the difference between sons and bastards? It's in First Corinthians, I'm sorry, it's in Hebrews 12. That you, if illeg- listen, that you receive discipline tells me you're a son and not a bastard or illegitimate child. The fact that I can receive correction. If I'm sitting here and I'm living with my girlfriend and for the first time I hear the gospel and I hear, you're supposed to be married and I feel bad about it. It's like, thank God you're alive. It's not bad that you feel bad. It's good that you feel bad. It's good that you have conviction. It's like, that means you're still alive. It means the Holy Spirit's in your life. What do I do? Marry the girl. This isn't brain surgery or not 
But don't do what God says not to do because he's been around for a long time and he's the inventor and you're the invention. When God says, I wouldn't do it that way, he's not giving you a suggestion. Well, I'm going to do what God said not to do. God's trying to kill my joy. He's the one who created orgasms. He's the one who created sex. God is in the good feeling mood. And the God that created all that says, don't. You got to listen to that guy. He invented fun. He said, taste and see. You could have, you know, be fed intravenously or eat bird seed all your life. But God said, taste and see that the Lord is good. Every time you eat something that tastes really good and it's nourishing your body, you're like, that's a good God. I like God. He gave me ice cream to nourish my body. I love dairy products and I love steak too. I'm simply saying, like, you understand that when we normalize evil, we are not doing people a favor. Please stop telling me we're doing people a favor. No, they hate you for it. Well, I'm sorry. It hated Jesus too. And how we share it matters, of course. And of course, we could be so self-righteous, like, look at us, we're so pure. I'm not, like, standing up for how we send the message. I'm simply saying the message needs to be said because it's a gospel. And I understand it's been done wrong. I understand it's been done the wrong way. I understand that. But listen, if you have true conviction, it's kind of funny. People can say it any way, and you still walk out of there going, I need to change. And I'd propose we all need to be in a culture where we get rebuked once in a while. I will say it. I'll be the first one with my hand up. I need to be rebuked at least a couple times a month. My attitude gets wandering off just like yours does. And it's good to be in a place where people actually tell you the truth instead of pretending like you're so holy or such a, you know, you write books, you must be God's right hand. Whatever. I am a son, though, and I am right about this message. (laughs) Would you stand, please? This is good salt. I wouldn't want to preach a message like this every week, but this is good salt. Lord, I just pray right now that you would bring conviction on our hearts. Thanks for listening to the Sermon of the Week. This weekly podcast is being translated into multiple languages. Please visit podcasts.ibethel.org.